Well, let me let me welcome um, everyone. I'm Philippe Bourgeois, Professor of Anthropology and Social Medicine here at UCLA in the Department of Psychiatry. And on behalf of the UCLA Health Equity and Translational Social Science Research Team and our Center for Social Medicine, I'm thrilled to welcome you today for this talk by Dr. Katrina Heyrana on reproductive health rights in our frightening era of increasingly criminalized contraceptive and abortion rights across the US and the globe. She will be presenting community-based participatory clinical and qualitative research she conducted on the Philippine X diaspora in the context of rising stigma due to a hardening of criminalization in the Philippines and here in the US. Dr. Heyrana is a staff physician in the Division of Family Planning within the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Cedars-Sinai Medical Center, and also directs her department's Ryan Residency Program. She completed her MD-PhD at Pennsylvania State in 2014, where she studied structural retrovirology and simultaneously expanded her scholarly repertoire into translational clinical and social medicine methods to analyze how vulnerable po populations make complex medical decisions. During her subsequent OBGYN residency at the University of Rochester, which she completed in 2016, she also developed a model curriculum for residents incorporating reproductive justice principles into patient care. In 2020, Katrina became our neighbor to undertake subspecialty training in a complex family planning fellowship at the University of, of Southern California. She currently provides general OBGYN care, complex contraceptive services, and abortion care to her patients at Cedar sinai and Planned Parenthood here in Los Angeles. She, her research employs the reproductive justice framework that she will be presenting today to explain the interplay, interplay between acculturation and the unique reproductive health needs of Asian American diaspora populations with a focus on Philippine X uh, diaspora communities. Despite her youth and grueling multi-methods clinical and research methods training, she has no less than 20 publications, at least half of them peer reviewed, and no less than 20 first author uh, conference abstracts. Her work on increasing access to reproductive health care uh, spans all family planning services, abortion and contraceptive care, and provides important insights into avenues for triggering pro-family planning belief change among people from diverse cultural religious backgrounds who have traditionally opposed abortion and contraceptive. Before Katrina takes the mic, please remember to put your questions and comments in the chat on the lower panel of the Zoom. And now it's your turn, Dr. Hirana. The mic is finally yours. Oh my God. <laughs> thank you so much for the introduction, Philippe, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here to present some of the findings from my research. So my only financial disclosure is that I'm a consultant for Cephala Pharmaceuticals on IUD development. Um, but I think that a more pertinent disclosure given the topic of this talk is my positionality to this issue as um, a second generation Filipino American who's struggled with the um, subject matter for a lot of my life. Um, that being said, a mentor of mine loves to say that the best kind of research is me search, where you're invested in the work because uh, you see yourself in the health concern, the community, or the policy question that you're studying. And so I hope that this uh, critical but not impersonal lens enriches rather than detracts from today's analysis. And if not, I always love an excuse to show off my family. Um, so while I'll be talking about some of my research in this talk today, I did want the conversation to be a little broader than just the study. Um, so I really want to situate family planning stigma, both anti-contraception and anti-abortion um, within um, Filipino colonial history and discuss its present day effects both in the Philippines and in the Filipino diaspora. And then we'll delve into the study focusing on the conceptual model and some of the key themes that we uncovered. And then lastly, we'll explain how findings might inform the way that we counsel and care for Filipino patients uh, seeking reproductive health services. 
and then look at broader implications for the anti-choice movement outside of Filipino communities. Okay, so we'll dive right into the first section. So really just setting the stage for how um, Filipino family planning stigma is generated um, and then also its health effects. So while pre-colonial Philippines included matriarchal communities that provided women the right to property, uh, divorce, abortion, um, and placed women and femme presenting gender non-conforming people in respected positions as community healers and shamans known as babaylans, uh, these roles were eroded over the course of 300 years of Spanish colonization. Oops. Um, colonizers ruled using the sword and the cross and the introduction of Catholicism created and then enforced very strict heteropatriarchal gender norms. Um, today, 80% uh, of Filipinos identify as Catholic, uh, though as with anything, their personal views span the spectrum from the Filipino Catholic Church's narrow and rigid interpretation um, to a more liberal and progressive view. Um, however, the political power of the Catholic Church as the moral authority in the Philippines remains really strong. Um, and their official doctrine forbids abortion and any contraception other than natural family planning, uh, considering essentially any method that prevents fertilization as a potential abortive treatment. So as a result of this pervasive influence, the Philippines is one of 26 countries that ban abortion under any circumstance. And not only is the constitutional right to life of the unborn enshrined in the constitution, um, anyone who seeks, provides, or cares for someone who has an abortion can be imprisoned for up to six years. <clears throat> Silence around abortion care is actually even emphasized for visitors coming to the Philippines. Um, this is a customs declaration form over here on the right side. Um, and it goes so far as to include abortion paraphernalia. Um, on its list of prohibited items to bring into the country. Um, but the restrictions don't stop at just abortion policy. So even contraception actually is really controversial. Um, so one good example of this is the drawn out legal battle that ensued after the passage of the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Law in 2012, also known as the RH Law, which is an ostensibly good faith effort to ensure access to contraception, sexual education, and maternal care. Um, I won't go through this entire timeline in detail, but essentially, as soon as the bill was passed, um, the Supreme Court and members of Congress strongly sought to subvert the bill um, by declaring all contraceptives as abortive essence and then defunding the Department of Health to prevent implementation of contraceptive programs. Um, in the present day, implementation is still very spotty. Um, and mostly enforced at the level of local governments. And so if you happen to live somewhere where politicians support contraceptive access, you'll have access. Otherwise, it's not at all guaranteed, not dissimilar to uh, what, what we're experiencing right now in the US with abortion care. Um, so strong anti-family um, planning sentiment, unsurprisingly has significant health consequences. Um, over here on the left side, basically uh, what this is showing that restrictions in contraceptive access and a total ban on abortion have really grave implications for the reproductive health of Filipino women. 54% um, of pregnancies are unintended and 37% are classified as mistimed or entirely unwanted. Um, and in the last 10 years, 1.2 million Filipino girls between 10 and 19 years old have had a child. So that's a rate of 24 babies an hour. Um, the overall birth rate in the Philippines is close to three births per woman, which is among the highest in Asia. And the burden, of course, disproportionately falls on people already living in poverty. And so when you break it down by socioeconomic status, um, as over here, oh yeah, you can't see my pointer, okay. <laughs> um, um, as over here, you can actually see that poor people have two more children than they say that they want. And in a country with an even more yawning gap between the rich and the poor, and poor than the United States, the inability to effectively plan a family can perpetuate these cycles of poverty. Um, additionally, of the over 1 million illegal abortions that occur annually in the Philippines, poor people are the least likely to be able to access safe modern methods of abortion. Um, and you can see that over here on the chart on the right. So many poorly resourced people who don't want to be pregnant turn to unsafe methods like catheter placement, uterine massage, and herbal remedies because the underground networks that are available to connect patients to experienced physicians are hard to access 
and are often 10 times more expensive than the other options. And the downstream result of this, of course, is that at least 1,000 pregnant people die from unsafe abortion a year, which is twice the all-cause maternal mortality rate in the U.S. Um, so Filipino people migrating to the U.S. often carry internalized stigmas around reproductive health services. And we know that this leads to difficulty having intergenerational conversations around sex and reproduction, um, as this qualitative study looking at sexual knowledge and communication between 120 Filip like Filipino parent-child pairs uh, shows. So Filipino families in the study perceive sexual knowledge in different ways, with parents emphasizing uh, morality, while, while children want to know facts and associated emotions around sex. Um, but it's hard to have an honest conversation between parents and children because parental emphasis on respect leads to conflict so frequently that teens ultimately chose to avoid the topic altogether. Um, and when that information exchange doesn't happen, um, we lose intergenerational knowledge and it makes us less well equipped to handle future reproductive health challenges. Uh, additionally, it also perpetuates the idea of sex and reproductive health as something to never talk about. Um, and can disincentivize both knowledge seeking and potentially access. Um, the stigma around sexual health in general and, re and family planning in particular may well be one of the major drivers of adverse reproductive health outcomes for um, Filipino people in the US. And this is just a sample that I've laid out here. So Filipino adolescents have high rates of adolescent pregnancies and earlier sexual debuts than teens from other major Asian subgroups. Um, Filipino birthing people face significant um, peripartum mor morbidity, including preterm birth, hypertension, preeclampsia, postpartum hemorrhage, and ICU admission. And while the drivers of these disparities are unclear, um, it's certainly possible that stigma may lead fam Filipino patients to avoid family planning and reproductive health services, leading downstream to less ability to plan for pregnancy, less ability to know whether things are going wrong in their pregnancy, and then therefore leading to some of these outcomes. However, um, a lot of the existing research doesn't differentiate between new Filipino immigrants and subsequent generations of Filipino American people. Um, but studies in other ethnic groups show that the length of residency in the United States um, can actually change people's health behavior and outcomes. And then additionally, no research has really examined how acculturation um, or the process of adjusting from the cultural norms of one's heritage country and then adapting to the norms of their receiving country um, might change family planning attitudes and behaviors amongst Filipino people in the US. All right, so why do we care? So other than the fact that approximately 3 million people living in the United States deserve to have their reproductive health needs studied and met, this community is really just a microcosm of the many communities that oppose family planning services um, due to religious or cultural beliefs. So we care because of this map. <laughs> we care because of the fact that the dark red on this Wootmacher map that is mapping the um, spread of anti-abortion laws and abortion restrictions since the Dobbs decision, Dobbs decision is becoming darker and darker and like showing more dark red um, because people are losing access to abortion services. Um, the pro-choice movement obviously needs new allies or new strategies to get people invested in protecting abortion care and family planning services. And studying these groups helps us to understand what arguments might be convincing in bringing people towards abortion support, especially specifically examining the experiences of those who transition their beliefs from anti to pro-choice over the course of their life. So I was really interested in this question as a second generation Filipino American who experienced that evolution over the course of my own lifetime and really wanted to explore this idea to see how other people in the Filipino community perceive that experience or honestly if it was even a common experience. And LA County is perhaps the ideal place to conduct this research as it has the highest concentration of Filipinos in the world outside of the Philippines and that includes both new immigrants and people who have lived in the U.S. for several generations. Uh, to the left over here um, is a map based on the 2017 census that gives a sense of scale of the large numbers of Filipino people in LA compared to other Asian groups. So here Filipinos are in the yellow, so all of this like bright yellow that you're sort of seeing. Um, 
shows sort of like groups of Filipino people. Um, and Filipinos overall are the largest group of Asian Americans in the city of LA and second in the country, in the county. Um, the other great thing about LA is that there are many established uh, community groups that are serving different aspects of the Filipino community in the region. And the pure numbers, diversity and access um, leads to a great opportunity to study perspectives on these taboo topics. So we designed a qualitative community-based participatory research study of adult Filipinx women in Los Angeles County to address these three objectives. So specifically elucidating cultural influences and belief formation about sex and family planning services, describing the attitudes, beliefs, and experiences around sex and family planning, and then identifying key factors in the evolution of views on sex and family planning over time. So I was new to LA County, um, as you heard from my CV. <laughs> And I wanted to use the CVPR model in my research design to ensure that our end product was community relevant. And so before starting this research project, I had to do a lot of legwork. Um, I reached out to Filipino community groups and offered to help with health programs and educational initiatives to get a sense of uh, local areas of concern and also just become a known quantity as a provider and a researcher. Um, these connections allowed me to recruit a community advisory team of first and second generation Filipino American women from LA with different areas of expertise and community connections who are passionate about um, Filipino health. We met every one to two months during which they guided every aspect of the research, starting from study design to recruiting strategies, to data interpretation and dissemination. Um, one of them even made the flyer that recruited her to my advisory team. Um, And so, oh, sorry, I skipped ahead a little bit here. So, um, like I said, the members met on a monthly or bi-monthly basis to vet and kind of discuss all of the different parts of the study. They received a $50 consultation fee for every meeting. They also piloted the interview guide for us and provide feedback on flow and blind spots. Um, myself and one of my research assistants conducted individual in-depth interviews in English. Um, that were recorded and transcribed using auto AI. Um, and then participants also completed a brief demographic survey that used a validated scale for Filipino American acculturation, which is what I briefly skipped to, and then received $40 gift cards for their participation. Um, we also, we continued interviews until thematic saturation was reached. Um, and the data was analyzed thematically uh, by three independent reviewers with the initial code book that we generated um, being vetted with the advisory team uh, using interview transcripts. Um, the analysis or the data was then like iteratively, the code book was iteratively refined after that interim analysis and then allowed for the completion of data collection and um, uh, data analysis. And so I really just wanted to touch briefly on the acculturation scale used. So it's a 12 question scale looking at three dimensions of acculturation. So first language use in different settings, language preferences in media, and then ethnicity of individuals in a person's social circle. The score can range anywhere from 12 to 60. Um, and it's based on a previously created and extensively validated measure in Hispanic communities called a short acculturation scale for Hispanics. Um, and it was chosen because it was psychometrically sound, short and practical to use, and it doesn't use other acculturation proxies like length of arrival to the US and generation. And so, uh, um, and like there are also cultural parallels between um, the experiences of, of Hispanic people and of Filipino people. The adapted version was validated in both English and Tagalog. And um, as we were going through uh, the, the process of having our um, participants take this, some of the feedback that we got, of course, was that it isn't perfect. It isn't a perfect tool. It doesn't account for speaking more than two languages. Um, it situates Filipino as opposite to quote unquote Americans who are all lumped together in a single category, even though American culture is obviously much more broad than a single idea. And so it's not perfect, but it was a good sort of shorthand to get a sense of the level of American exposure in, in, our, um, in our participants' day-to-day -day lives. So we interviewed 33 participants between 19 and 50 years old, 
And they're divided in this table into uh, first and second generation Filipino Americans. The age of participants did definitely skew on the younger side with many of the participants being in their 20s despite attempts to recruit older individuals through community groups. Um, most of the participants were raised Catholic, so 88% in total, though many no longer practice the religion of their childhood. And then other Christian denominations that they belong to included Protestant without further specifications, um, Iglesia Ni Cristo, which is a Christian denomination based in the Philippines and Seventh-day Adventists. Most of the participants, as you can see down here, were uh, highly acculturated. Um, even if they had immigrated to the US, uh, like early, uh, like not too long ago. Um, and so this suggests a high degree of exposure to an incorporation of quote unquote American culture in their daily lives. Um, regarding their personal experiences with family planning service utilization, the majority, so about 88%, um, had used some type of contraception method previously, but only two had personal experience with accessing abortion care. All participants did uh, note that they supported abortion. And so the map on the right shows the distribution of participants across Los Angeles County and also their regions of origin on the, oh, on the left and the right, sorry, um, in the Philippines. I didn't put stars for every participant if there were multiple in one area, but you can kind of get a sense of how things are clustering. So in LA County, many of the participant locations correlated with known high density Philippine um, enclaves. So historic Filipino town, um, Long Beach, Panorama City, Eagle Rock and Glendale, and then West Covina. Um, in terms of Filipino origin, people tended to cluster in the Northern regions, especially um, around Luzon but there were six people who we interviewed um, who were from like Central and South Philippines. So participants discussed uh, their cultural, religious and familiar, familial influences on their initial family planning belief formation, the evolution of those beliefs over time, um, and then highlighting the divergence between anti-FP heritage cultural values versus their current beliefs, which they sometimes identified as American, um, and in fact, a process of acculturation. And so in order to understand both what changed and then how it changed, we ended up having to combine two conceptual models illustrating the phenomena of acculturation and belief modification to contextualize these emerging themes. So the first model that we adapted is an acculturation model from Schwartz et al. that contests the idea of unidirectional assimilation and posits that people adopt values from their receiving culture, so over here on the right, while still incorporating beliefs from their heritage cultures on the left at different and individualized levels. This model also leaves measures of acculturation broad, and so it allows you users um, to incorporate what they consider important cultural contrasts on either side of your kind of like of your arrow. Um, but what this model is missing is a mechanism. So how do a person's values change? What drives them to sympathize with or adopt one set of cultural standards over the other? And so we sought out a second model to explain how people edit their beliefs in response to external, so like new environments or people and internal, so like they're, they're kind of learning their own new knowledge um, pressures. And we hit upon the integrative belief dynamics model, model from Glassic et al, which describes a really complex process of belief change. So kind of taking you through this, uh, beliefs about any topic can either be generated by the individual or by their social network. And as people get exposed to different viewpoints from their social network or in different individual observations, it can really lead to cognitive dissonance between bo their beliefs and what a person is sort of seeing and experiencing. This sometimes becomes a trigger for change in order to resolve that dissonance, which can happen in several ways. So a person can just update their own internal beliefs and nothing else that takes them towards the sort of like left side of this um, cycle. Um, people can edit their social networks to remove the source of cognitive dissonance without necessarily changing their beliefs, or they can kind of do both, update both their beliefs and edit out the people who aren't in line with those beliefs anymore. And so when we combine these models, it provides a framework to understand the directionality of a culturative belief change while also offering mechanisms. So kind of allowing us to have the explanation for the middle part of this like bimodal arrow. Um, 
we presented three themes contextualized within this framework to show how family planning belief change can occur despite Filipino cultural values that are traditionally opposed to um, contraception and abortion. So I'll go, I'll, we'll go through each of them, but the three things that we'll kind of be talking through are first, enculturation of anti-family planning views through family authority. Uh, two is the influence of direct family planning experiences in shifting family planning beliefs. And then three is belief editing through internal change rather than outwardly rejecting one's heritage culture. And we'll get into what all of that means in just a second. Okay, so our first theme I kind of highlighted here in these like little dotted lines explored the mechanism for enculturation of norms around sex and family planning. So where, like, where did we start? Um, and so that's on the on your uh, bi-directional arrow on the heritage side, and then sort of the baseline uh, thoughts and feelings that people have about family planning. So these values are tra transmitted through hierarchical social networks that are dominated by parents, other adults and religious communities without much space for individual belief, belief formation. So definitely dominated by the social networks. And then adherence to abstinence and anti-family planning beliefs are seen as a way to demonstrate respect and buy-in around collective cultural values. Um, while any deviance gets penalized through community shame. And we'll talk through that a little bit more. So immigrant families transmitted rigid anti-family planning views through hierarchical social networks dominated by, um, like I said, parents, other adults, um, and religious communities. And then parents and family members really saw adherence to these values, the values being abstinence, the avoidance of contraception, and opposition to abortion as demonstrative of family respect. Um, families really strongly discourage discussing these topics and stymied any participants' attempts at nuanced family planning conversations with relatives. And so um, <clears throat> this participant described it by saying, um, I remember their attitude about children, like the way they raised me. There's no negotiating with children. It's very much like I'm your parent and I'm not in discussions with you. Expectations to conform to anti-family planning norms were perceived as manifestations of utang na loob, or debt of one's inner self, which is a cultural belief that parental care must be repaid with a child's life, love, service, and obedience. Um, one participant kind of explained it by saying, uh, it's been in our history forever, it's a norm, you're expected to stay and take care of everyone who's taken care of you your entire life. And then given the deep cultural significance of Utang Lo'ob, they felt hesitant to challenge anti-family planning beliefs and assert their own family planning perspectives or any perspectives that potentially con conflicted with their parents' teaching. The second collective mechanism is more about enforcing adherence to sexual and family planning norms, which was chismis or gossip. So family and uh, community members frequently engaged in chismis to spread cautionary stories about community members who strayed from traditional Filipino values which led to unintended pregnancies, unsafe abortions, or other consequences. Um, these stories highlighted the dangers of defying social norms around sex and shamed those who have violated these rules. And so chismis was usually used to inform, enforce compliance with restrictive norms around sex, contraception, and abortion due to the social costs associated with becoming a subject of gossip. Um, over here, one of our participants talks about a conversation that her aunt had with her mother um, saying, my aunts found out we were having boyfriends and our parents knew. And they were telling my mom like, oh my God, no, you're letting them have boyfriends. What if they get pregnant? Which scared my mom, which led to all of this, you know, not being able to talk about sex and everything. However, uh, the fear of just mischanging uh, community perceptions about a person's inherent value didn't always prevent Filipino people from accessing these services. So some participants concealed their own contraceptive use or abortion experiences from their families, fearing the anticipated shame and devaluation from these disclosures. And so this um, participant recounted her sister's own abortion experience saying, she went through with an abortion procedure and my sister obviously kept it a secret because she didn't want to seem like she was a bad person. I think my parents would have seen her and probably called her like, not to her face, but probably to her back, like, oh, my daughter's a whore.
So the second theme addresses the drivers of belief change uh, that generated the cognitive dissonance <clears throat> that eventually resulted in a shift from anti to pro family planning beliefs. Um, participants noted that direct experiences led to these shifts that de-emphasized their enculturated social network values in favor of views that acknowledged an individual's need for contraception and abortion. Um, so participants describe slightly different contexts for their moves towards pro-abortion and pro-contraception values. So when developing pro-contraception beliefs, they pointed to firsthand experiences that shifted their beliefs about the utility of contraception. Um, while many of them used contraception to prevent unwanted pregnancy, some of them also used to hormonal contraceptives to treat medical problems like dysmenorrhea or menorrhagia. Um, participants speculated that the opposition to contraception could be due um, to limited knowledge about non-contraceptive benefits and that education about these benefits might ameliorate stigma. So for example, this participant noted, I feel like a lot of Filipinos who don't have opinions about birth control or they're not for it could be about whether they really understand it. I thought birth control was weird or it shouldn't be a thing. Like you shouldn't change your body because of it. But then the more I started learning about it and what it actually does and what it provides, it did shape how I feel. Participants also noted that seeing family, friends, or other acquaintances suffer adverse consequences, such as um, health complications or financial challenges after an unplanned pregnancy, was another major catalyst for supporting contraception. And these participants felt like contraception could have changed the life trajectories of those with unplanned pregnancies and that moral barriers shouldn't limit contraceptive access. So this participant noted, like, it's a mixture of having to go through it myself, but then I also meet people whose entire trajectories have been changed because there was an unplanned pregnancy, usually because either a conservative family or religion wasn't on board with contraception. And now you're consigning teenagers to having to play life on the extra hard level because of your own personal handicaps. So whereas pro-contraceptive views primarily grew out of personal experiences, only two of our interviewees discussed uh, their own personal abortion experiences. So oral abortion attitudes from, bless you, for most people evolved from personal experiences with unplanned pregnancy. So either their own or being a confidant for a friend or relative with an unplanned pregnancy. And reckoning with the practical implications of unplanned pregnancy, such as educational or career consequences, financial repercussions, um, and social ramifications really help participants emphasize with abortion seeking individuals. So like this um, participant noted, having pro-choice views came from personal experiences. That pregnancy scare taught me that there's a possible chance of you being able to bring life into the world, whether you're ready or not. And for participants who didn't endorse personal exposures to unplanned pregnancy, formal evidence-based sexual education and also impartial philosophical debates facilitated their critical reconsideration of previously held uh, anti-abortion beliefs. And subsequent exposures to pro-abortion views in different social contexts often reinforced these views over time. And so for this participant, her first exposure to um, uh, essentially like pro-choice views was with through impartial sex ed. She noted that it's because of their, that that I started to form these pro-choice points of view that were different from the upbringing, debunking all of the myths of whatever is told to you with Filipino or Catholic Christian culture. So the third theme resolves the cognitive dissonance between anti-family planning heritage views and new pro-family planning views through internal belief updating. So like we mentioned, individuals can incorporate new experience to update a focal belief by either internally revising their now conflicting related beliefs or by distancing social network members who initially provided these conflicting beliefs. Um, participants updated their own internal beliefs from anti to pro family planning views, but in general, actually maintain close relationships with their families despite, it, despite holding now conflicting core values. And so the decision to maintain close ties to family members um, and to continue to identify with and appreciate Filipino culture represents a move towards true biculturalism rather than unidirectional acculturation. And participants describe this evolution as a process of unlearning or decolonization, um, really acknowledging the religious roots of anti-contraception and anti-abortion tenets and Catholic teachings enforced through Spanish colonialism. 
um, adoption of sex positive attitudes and by extension, pro-family planning beliefs were viewed as a return to natural human behaviors rather than an acculturative or Americanizing process. Um, and so this participant noted that she was raised to believe that any sexual encounters before marriage were bad and that there is sin and she would go to hell. And it was when she was 16 that I kind of started unlearning all of those beliefs for myself, that sex is not inherently bad, it's natural and it's human. Um, though participants recognized the historical origins of sex shaving and anti-family planning beliefs, they were frustrated at how these views had negatively influenced their initial contraception or their initial conception and engagement with sex, relationships, and reproductive health care. But even as participants criticized the damaging effects of Filipino cultural stigma around family planning, they also noted uh, differences between their parents' formative contexts and their own and identified their respective exposures um, and by extension, the perspectives and resources that were afforded to them by American immigration as foundations for belief editing. So this participant noted that it can help, I think, um, Oh, I can't see the quote, sorry. When you understand where someone is coming from, when I can understand that my parents just didn't know any different or that it's a privilege to receive the education that I do, I'm not as mad at them for talking to me about sex growing up, right? And so understanding um, contextual differences help participants accept the divergent um, family planning attitudes between themselves and their relatives without significant social network updating. Um, participants saw the conflict between their pro-family planning personal views and the anti-family planning heritage values as just one negative aspect of Filipino culture that they chose not to perpetuate rather than a defining conflict um, in the larger process of developing their own personal Filipino American identities. And so just to kind of um, move on to like implications for um, for like clinical practice and policy. Basically, these findings have several implications for sexual and reproductive health care workers um, with Filipino patients whose values and preferences are poorly defined in, in the medical literature. So first, um, patients presenting for any family planning care, including basic contraception, might be struggling with moral conflicts, even if they support contraception and abortion access. They may also have an incomplete or inaccurate understanding of contraceptive methods of action and side effects. And so fact-based empathetic counseling and providing time for patients to consider their options or to confer with trusted social contacts may help cultivate a positive relationship by recreating the circumstances that triggered pro-family planning belief change in these participants. Um, secondly, uh, participants' family planning views shifted following firsthand experiences with services or from accounts from trusted acquaintances who offered concrete narratives for contraception and abortion that fit into their own lives. So even though clinicians are often taught to uh, omit personal narratives from their counseling, in this particular patient population, normalizing patient situations with past experiences that clinicians are willing to share may actually provide comfort and connection. And then lastly, um, participants remain proud and protective of their Filipino heritage despite any divergence that they experience from anti-family planning views that they perceive as integral to their culture. Many of them remain close to their family members who played key roles in this enculturation. And so dismissing anti-family planning views as evidence of ignorance or willful harm is unlikely to resonate with Filipino patients and really may alienate them during clinical encounters. Um, and so while family planning uh, or while Filipino patients may disclose conflicts with family members or friends about accessing abortion and contraception, our providers should really validate patients' decision-making processes without denigrating their social circle or um, cultural beliefs. And then lastly, our findings may also provide some broader insights into avenues for belief change and people from cultural or religious backgrounds that traditionally oppose family planning. So our participants' initial in anti-abortion views actually evolved analogously to those described in a qualitative study of Catholic women engaged in pro-choice philanthropic activism. So this is a figure from, from that paper. Um, both Filipino women in our study um, and Catholic women who are largely white recalled being taught foundational anti-abortion views without much room for questioning, undergoing a period of internal criticism of those views due to personal experiences and new cultures. 
or new exposures, and then adopting pro-abortion views following that questioning, and then ultimately re reconciling those views with their original identities. So anti-abortion views that are passed on through authority figures, so for example, religion or family members, um, in an authoritarian way where pe people are able are not able to wrestle with the information and um, integrate it themselves, are thus probably vulnerable to cognitive dissonance and eventual belief change um, as it's triggered by personal necessity or by compelling evidence-based viewpoints. And so as the pro-abortion movement uh, searches for new allies in this post row world, Groups may consider hosting culturally or religiously tailored community programs about abortion or potentially authoring op-eds in community media outlets to seed cognitive dissonance and belief change in groups that were previously thought to be immovably anti-abortion. And that was my last slide. Um, thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Okay, we'll open up the floor for questions. Uh, feel free to either raise your hand or type it in the chat, uh, whichever you feel comfortable doing. Also, if you have questions in person, feel free to ask them too. <laughs> Philippe, are you talking? Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> oh no. Uh, perhaps type it into the chat if we can't hear you. Also, there were a couple of people who did type in the chat, right? Are you able to see the chat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. This was so informative. Like I learned a lot. Um, and I remember you said before you began your com um, community-based participatory research, you took the time to like get to know and be known by other folks in the community. How mm -hmm. long of a process, how, how long did that take? How did, uh, before you could gain their trust? Yeah, I, honestly, I feel like it's, it's still an ongoing process, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I started fellowship. This was a project that I did in fellowship. And so this, is, I started fellowship, um, in the middle of 2020, like in the middle of the COVID yeah. pandemic. <laughs> um, and so a lot of the outreach I did initially was actually, um, like virtual. So like conducting virtual seminars and things like that. Um, and then eventually like doing COVID vaccine drives with my husband mm -hmm. and like other community <laughs> groups. Um, and uh, also just like joining um, like a grassroots sort of community organizing um, Filipino women's group. Um, and so like those were things that really helped me get to know the community. And I feel like a lot of, a lot of that getting to know the community was an ongoing process that like uh, that coincided with the creation of the, of the project and the conceptualization of the project. So, maybe time before I really started working on the project was somewhere around like six months to a year. Um, but one of the things that was great about it is that once we finally started recruiting for the project, which was in like Jan December, January, December of 2020, 2021, I guess, um, we like recruitment went very quickly and was very efficient. And I do think that some of it was like laying that legwork, but also like having a community advisory team members who were really well connected to the community and like um, just like cultivating those relationships. We do have a couple questions in the chat. Uh, Kim is asking for the third theme of belief editing. Did some people note that they were unable to resolve the cognitive dissonance 
and thus separated family ties over belief differences? That's a good question. Um, not in our sample, um, but that is definitely something that people, so like it wasn't the personal experiences of some of the people of our participants, but some of them mentioned that happening to other people in like their families um, or in their communities. Um, and so while I think like for most of the people that I talked to, their process was much more internal, I, I don't doubt that for that there's social network editing um, involved as well. And then, yeah. And then a few more questions from Renee. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. Um, what do you think are some ways we can move the needle of access to contraception and sexual education um, in the Philippines? I'm currently doing HIV research, but not in the Philippines. Oh gosh, <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to this question. <laughs> um, I, there are a lot of people on the ground that are working on this in the Philippines. Um, there are like certain groups that are actually like working on like pro like abortion and like pro contraception like access and things like that out there. Um, one that comes to mind is like Lake Pen. Um, but I I think that one of the things that in like kind of doing the research that that led to this project and looking at what contraception and abortion access looked like in the Philippines, um, one of the things that I really noticed is that um, for the most part, it's grassroots efforts that um, improve access to contraception and sexual education, um, which is unfortunate, right? Because you're paying taxes to the government and the government <laughs> from a top-down sort of situation should be, should be able to provide better services and more effective services to, to people. Um, but that does currently seem to be the case uh, there that like truly um, community care and sort of like grassroots efforts are what are allowing people to um, access contraception and access sort of accurate sexual health education. And then the second part of your question was, can you tell me more about lessons learned and best practices when conducting CBPR among the Filipino community? And what are your next steps based on these research findings? Um, lessons learned. I think one of the things that was, uh, I guess like I, I mentioned this a little bit when I was talking, when I was um, addressing the polls question, but one of the, um, one of the things that I think was like best practices for me was, I don't think that I, I don't think that this project would have been as effective without the like, legwork that I did beforehand. So just like getting to know communities, not as a researcher, but just as like a person who cared about them and like wanted to get involved. Um, and then also like as a doctor before I was a researcher and things like that. Um, and so I think like that's the first thing, like kind of showing that you're like interested in them outside of like the research and um, also just like continuing to be there. Um, so like like in the present day, I'm continuing to like organize with a group called Gabriella um, and uh, doing things like that. Uh, so just kind of like showing your dedication and things of that nature. Um, and then what are your next steps based on these research findings? So another entire part of this, um, of this project that I didn't talk about at all was actually people's personal experiences with like contraception and abortion. So what contraception they've used in the past um, like how they accessed abortion, uh, first like sexual experiences, things like that. So like actual like um, experiences, not just of like their cognitive changes, but also of like the, the way that they interacted with the healthcare system. Um, and from those conversations, there are, there were a lot of suggestions for um, ways that as a health community or as like community groups that we could intervene um, to help make uh, people more comfortable, A, with like reproductive health care, and then also B, to like optimize, like the like make people feel um, like empowered to step into those clinics and be able to ask for what they want and things like that. Um, and so those are some of the things that we're working on based on uh, those suggestions. Um, some of them include like uh, 
doing like sexual health education, not um, just like with one generation, but almost like inter facilitating like intergenerational conversations um, within some of the community groups that we reached out to and worked with. Um, the other thing that came up a lot was actually like almost making the process of knowledge seeking more anonymous. Um, there are some Planned Parenthoods uh, that have like a text based like um, like app that you can kind of text into and have people like respond to questions about like contraception and abortion and uh, sort of like de-identified in like anonymous manner. Um, and there was definitely some calls for for a similar sort of intervention, um, like that's uh, specific to the Filipino community. So there's so those are some of the other things. Um, is that a hand up? Yeah, Eco. What's your question? <laughs> Hi, Dr. Irana. This is like a really engaging uh, topic and also treatment of the discussion. Um, you mentioned something about where Philippine X providers may need to pro provide some of their own, like their own narratives when kind of counseling. And I think that was interesting because that's, you know, as you mentioned, it's like kind of breaking Western conventions. Um, and then at the same time, they're also breaking kind of Filipino con conventions. So can you either in your own personal experience or in the people you've talked to or in the community groups, like how um, providers who might find themselves in that situation where they're actually breaking like they're straddling two worlds and breaking the conventions of both and what either in your experience has been helpful or what kind of resources we might need to like better empower kind of this, this, this area of work. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, I, I think like the first thing that I want to say, right, is to like not, I don't want to encourage people to do anything that they're not comfortable with because if you're not comfortable like sharing stories, and like that's not something that natu that comes naturally to you because of sort of the way that we were enculturated as doctors here in like the western in like the western world, um, then it'll probably come across as like disingenuous, awkward, uncomfortable, and patients will also respond to that in a visceral way. Um, what I, what I've found is that I've started um, one of this is maybe different from other fields of medicine because like in family planning, especially if you're talking about contraceptive counseling, there isn't usually a right answer, right? Like there, there are great reasons for patients to use an IUD. There are great patients for or great reasons for patients to use like oral contraceptives. Uh, there are great reasons for them to use a patch, for them to use non-hormonal methods, like things like that. And so what often happens uh, with patients, um, especially patients who haven't had many people to talk about this with, is that they kind of push the decision to you and say like, what would you do? Like, how, how do you make your decisions about this and things like that? Um, and it can be frustrating, honestly, and like make people, make people feel like you're leaving them hanging if you say, you know, it's up to you. Like, this is totally your decision. And so, um, one of the ways that I've like started to like walk patients through it is by um, like disclosing a little bit about like I how I've chosen contraceptive contraceptive methods in the past, or if they're um, I mean like TMI, but I had an IUD for seven years, and like um, when I do patient counseling, they ask about like did it hurt, like how can you make it more comfortable, things like that. Um, my IUD experience was terrible. Like it was perfectly placed. It was properly placed. The doctor was great, but I passed out and like my friend had to come pick me up from the clinic. And so like, I, I do a lot of, um, like I do, I make some of those disclosures, which honestly like makes patients laugh, makes it make them, make them feel comfortable. And also kind of makes them feel like a badass when they don't pass out in front of me. <laughs> and so, um, I, just little things like that. I think like things that you feel comfortable sharing, things that you feel like might humanize yourself to patients. Although like, I know like in, in your field of work, sometimes like they're probably more frequently than a family planning, there is a right answer. Like patients should get this therapy or this therapy for their like problem X. So it may not be as applicable in fields where like there isn't always like several right answers. And then popping back into the chat. So Issa asked, um, have you ever worked with NGOs like 
Bugat and Turtle Sudan are compared for their contraceptive. Uh, LARC education models address the inherent conservatism or any cultural cognitive dissonance. You know, I haven't yet. Um, that's a really great um, point that like there is stuff out there that I haven't really looked at yet. Um, but that would be a good next step. Thank you for that. And then believe maybe this is what you were trying to say. <laughs> yeah, I can, if you, I, I, does, am I audible now? Okay, I'm so, I'm so sorry, I apologize, I'm embarrassed. I just, very, I'm so sorry, because it's brief, It's it has to be brief now, it's at the end. But it occurs to me that comparing specifically the Puerto Rican and Philippine X experiences with respect to um, the nonlinear um, positive and negative outcomes of acculturation uh, could be very interesting because both share very similar actual um, colonial experiences in being, you know, the double whammy of both Spanish colonialism and, and US colonialism, military bases, and also very large diasporas in the United States. Um, and then the aggregation terms of Latinx and, and, and Asian are, are, are actually surprisingly similar in some of the challenges that aggregation um, you know, um, you know, sort of imposes on different distinct migration tree streams, which would affect Philippine X and, and Puerto Rican populations in, in perhaps similar ways. Anyhow, I was excited by uh, your talk because most of the work on the Latinx, the Latinx health paradox has been done by economists and, and they're extraordinarily good at quantitative data, but they've never talked to a human being. Um, and, and, and which is true of a lot of medical and clinical research. So congratulations on being such a skilled um, clinician, obviously, such a gifted clinician, and also for um, working on this topic at this moment in history. So thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I like that. There are, I like totally see what you're saying about like the parallels between like Puerto Rican and Filipino populations. I think like the, um, the colon, one of the things that, um, that, that like has been like seen in the literature is like the idea that like Filipinos are like the Latinos of like Asia, just because of like the colonial heritage and like how that gets incorporated into like our culture and how the sort of downstream effects from that. Um, one of the interesting things actually about um, like the like the healthy migrant paradox in like Filipino populations regarding like reproductive health specifically is um, so for, for people that are on this talk but aren't familiar with this paradox, it's the idea that when people first migrate from their home country to the United States, their health outcomes are initially better than like people who are from the same ethnic background but have like remained in the US for a long time. Um, or like we're born in the United States to begin with. And um, one of the interesting things about Filipinos specifically when it comes to at least like preterm birth rates is that Filipinos who have recently migrated from the Philippines and Filipinos who have like lived in the United States for a long time have similar rates of preterm birth. Um, and their rates of preterm birth are about as high as black women, like born in the US black women. Um, and so to speak again to your point about data aggregation or da data disaggregation, um, one of the big pushes in like Asian American reproductive health or Asian American health in general, right, is disaggregating the, like more than 50 ethnicities that comprise like the Asian umbrella because like their, our experiences are so completely different. Um, and so I love the points that you brought up. Thank you for getting on the mic, yay, <laughs> being able to articulate them. There is one more question in there, but I know we're a little over time. Yeah. But it's, it's, I think it's a really good question. <laughs> if you want to, if anybody wants to stay, if you're okay with just answering that last one, with uh, Monica. Oh, Monica, I see you. Okay. Um, given your findings, what do you see as the role of doulas for abortion or childbirth, et cetera, for Philippine X communities? How would you introduce a potential role or help to a patient in any particular way? I honestly love this question. Um, there is like great uh, sort of like research about like the utility of doulas um, 
for improving like health outcomes, especially for marginalized populations, but specifically for like black women. I think like that is like the, the community in which like this, it's been shown to have like a lot of utility so far. Um, it's been understudied in um, Filipino populations, but also in Asian American populations, because when you look at who is most likely to like use doula services um, of all people who are giving birth, um, actually in the state of California, um, the like Asian people are the least likely to um, contract for doula services, which is unfortunate because um, Asian people are also the most likely or as likely as black women to have unplanned C-sections um, and have like disproportionately uh, poor birth outcomes that like potentially could be avoided by uh, by advocacy and by having somebody in your corner, by having somebody help you stick to your birth plan and things like that. I just don't even know that there's yet a conversation in the Filipino um, community about like the fact that you deserve to have a good birth experience mm -hmm. and that birth can be like empowering and that birth can be um, that like it can be like a source of your strength and that it, you are able to advocate your, for yourself during that process. Um, just kind of speaking colloquially, colloquially to like friends and family who have given birth, uh, it's not an experience where they feel like they can speak up. I don't know that I've heard any Filipino woman tell me that she's had a birth, she like had a birth plan or anything like that. And so I, I could see like doulas um, being like transformative for a community of people that like really like places value in community and like the input of other people in like finding kind of collective strength like Filipino populations do. Um, and uh, and Isa just put in the um, chat that in the Philippines, there is like a Pinay Duas collective, which is awesome. Um, and yeah, I think like the way to introduce them in to patients, um, to Filipino patients would just like be by introducing them as like a potential like extended family member, you know? Like if you're thinking about who they are, like in in the process of your birth, like an extended family member and advocate, uh, people who can help and protect you through the process. Yay. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thanks for staying over to all of you guys. Um, and and thank you for letting me present this work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adam. Uh, save the date for our next. Talk, which will be on June 9th. Uh, it's a Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Caroline Parker give her talk. So stay tuned. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>